Wonderful. Thank you guys for joining us. This is fantastic. We have a great webinar for you tonight. I We have over 320 people that have registered for this webinar, which is absolutely awesome. And I expect that we'll have about 80 show up. I'm guessing, actually, no, I think it's going to be more like 90 or 100 show up, um, it, which is I can't thank you guys enough for showing up. This is very exciting. I'm Sarah Cooperman. I'm the CEO of SCW Fitness of Water in Motion and our new SEAT program, which is a chair-based fitness program. We're going to be talking about nutrition through the ages. Um, and what we're going to be doing is every individual needs essential amino acids, proteins, fatty acids, and array of vitamins and minerals to maintain our health. However, nutritional needs can vary greatly from one life stage to another. So these wonderful panel of experts are going to talk about nutritional needs and how they differ from life cycles and demographics and as Rosie so astutely made us aware, psychosocial backgrounds as well. So I'm very excited to welcome these people. We have Sohala Digsby, and she's a registered dietitian, author, and a developer of the life-changing 52-day Best Body Countdown program from gyms to use as well as individuals to provide the missing piece of the fitness puzzle, which is nutrition and accountability. She's got over 20 years of experience, not only in the nutrition area, but also as a fitness pro. And we've got Rosie Malahan with us. She's a 200 hour yoga instructor, and she's also got her master's degree. She's got over 15 years of experience teaching and counseling virtually live and yoga and leadership and organizational development. Um, she holds a master's of science degree and served as an adjunct faculty member at the University of Rhode Island. Rosie also is one of our stars in the SEAT program, which we greatly appreciate her lending her talents there. And she's one of our favorite newer presenters at Mania. So I highly recommend you check her out. And then we've got Amber Toole. Amber, I think we discovered you online during the pandemic like reading your posts. I was like, this this chick knows what she's talking about. She's Thank got a best, <laughs> or either that or she's fooled me, okay? Which <laughs> either way works. Um, she's got a bachelor's of science degree in physical education and health. And through educating, coaching, training, and teaching, Amber is, she writes, is passionate, but she's probably one of the most passionate people I know about spreading the truth about health and fitness. So I've got these wonderful ladies on this panel and we're going to dive right in. And I'm going to start with my first question. And so Hala, I'm, I'm digging into you, girl. Um, how does nutrition differ for children or those who are still growing? Okay. So as we look at the life cycle, obviously kids are growing up and out, their bone density is increasing, their muscles are growing. And then after about 25, your brain and your bone stop growing. Um, and a lot of other things just start growing out instead of up. And so you don't need as much energy unless you're training for a specific event or as for you as an instructor, you might be teaching a lot of times a day. So I usually use this plate that Sarah likes. I'm going to give this as an example. This is a little plate from in my kitchen that I've had since my kids were little. Um, and so you can think of protein, carbohydrate, or starch, and then this as vegetables. And for most of us, if we're not trying to grow anymore, like many of you maybe, and us would be non-starchy veggies like broccoli and asparagus and salad and things like that. But if they are trying to grow, they still need the protein, they still need the carbohydrate and starch, but they need more carbohydrate and starch because they need more calories total. And they might even need their plate filled higher as they're growing and especially if they're more active and less likely to be sedentary. So they would need their starchy veggies like their sweet potatoes, their corn, their peas, legumes or, or beans, but they often fall in that category filling this too. And so I think that's an easy way for parents to, to or even, you know, 
trainers and people to talk to youth without helping them over consume, over consume thoughts about calories and measuring and all that. If they're not an athlete, especially they don't need that detail. They just need to know that they need to fill their plate as high as they need to based on their hunger and activity level. And if they have less of an activity level or they're not growing anymore, they would reduce that down and add less of those starches to the bottom, if that makes sense. And I do have a plate that helps people measure. This might be the one you were saying you like, Sarah. So this helps. I like both of them. To yeah. not over, overthink it. Sometimes people really try to overthink it. And it's not that hard if you're, if you're fueling in regular intervals. Right. I think that's great. And I like, you know, the idea we're thinking that we're growing. I think Rosie, I asked you a little bit about your training of athletes and how you deal with that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting when you're working with athletes, especially those who are still growing, is that you don't realize how much nutrition and development go hand in hand. And if you have an athlete who's on the field who needs to think quick, troubleshoot, communicate, no place, plan two steps ahead, then not only are you fueling for the muscles, but um, our younger athletes need to be fueling the brain as well, because if they do not get that nutrition, they can't think clearly, they can't retain information, they're, they're fatigued. So their energy level is dependent and their brain health is dependent. And that plays a huge role in their success of an athlete mentally, not just physically. That's great. You're absolutely right. And Amber, you really tend to specialize in training women. <laughs> women of a certain age. Um, but you do train women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. How do you find that if somebody is still growing, if they're training for an event, or if they, um, they, they increase their activity level, how should they change their nutrition? Well, Sarah, one of the things I always work on with my clients is trying to get them to really think about balancing out their plate. When I work with people, no matter their age, I can almost tell you that the majority of people that I've worked with in my own experience don't get enough protein. And if you are training for an event, and I have trained people to um hike the Appalachian Trail for six months. And I've trained people who, you know, did competitions, um, for figure competitions and bodybuilding competitions. And depending on what event they're preparing for, they've really got to nail that nutrition and make sure that they're getting in everything they need. So protein is always major for helping us maintain that muscle mass. And then also just the variety of fruits and vegetables. And carbohydrates, you know, depending on what they're doing, like if you have someone who is running races or they're doing a triathlon, they're going to need to be able to balance out that carbohydrate intake to make sure that they have enough to fuel them through the workout. But it also needs to be balanced with the protein and the healthy fats and then the variety of fruits and vegetables as well, different colors. Different colors. I love it. Eat the rainbow. Eat the rainbow. That's, that's, I always think of what I learned over the pandemic and doing these webinars has been absolutely one of my favorite things that I've done. Um, and there's a few things I learned. Eat the rainbow, avoid alcohol, which ah. <laughs> um, it's just, yeah, thank you so much for bringing that to my attention, Sohala. Okay. And so it's been different, you know, all these things we learned. I'm going to ask everybody who's listening. We have, we've just hit a hundred, you guys. So congratulations. Do me a favor and you can click on the chat box. Um, you go to the left of the green share button and you guys can click on the chat box. And I love it. I have people that are already from Massachusetts, New Jersey, Maryland, um, New Hampshire, Tennessee, Illinois. Type in where you're from. I love to know where you guys are from. And also, this is your webinar. So if you've got questions, I try to stay aware of that. And we're, oh, look, we got people from New York, North, North Carolina, um, Florida, Virginia. I love all this. Okay, there's a lot of you. So if you guys have specific questions it's your webinar, I want you to ask it. So I'm going to ask another question now. And again, so Hale, I'm going to start with you. How does nutrition change as we start to enter our senior years? 
So most people are at their maximum weight between 50 and 60. And a lot of people in the fitness industry have been in that diet culture mentality. So if you're a trainer and you're in your thirties, but you're training someone who's going through menopause or who's on the other side of 60, their goals may be completely different than yours. So you have to be careful, I think, to not let some of your diet visions and goals go into, into theirs. So for example, some of them are really trying to maintain muscle mass by not under eating protein because their joy of eating isn't the same as it was when they had multiple kids around the table or their desire to eat isn't the same because their taste buds have changed. And, you know, it's a little bit different. So I think we need to be careful not to assume that everyone is in that same weight loss mentality or whatever it is that a lot of our clients have been in, but it does change from decade to decade. As you know, after 20, the metabolism declines a little bit, not as much as people think, and then a little bit more in their 30s, a little bit more in their 40s, and more drastically in 50s, 60s, and 70s. And mostly that has to do with sarcopenia, the lack of muscle mass, the loss of muscle mass. So it's really important, like Amber said, to really focus on protein. And like Rosie mentioned earlier, is to make sure it's an enjoyable environment to, to pair food with enjoyable thoughts and, and with company, good company and different things like that, especially for empty nesters or people that are alone, food just doesn't have the joy it once did. And so um, we have to be careful not to, you know, share weight loss and, and diet mentality with them or say, I'm going to go to gluten-free. I think you should too. Cause if that was a huge percent of their calories and it was serving them well, and now they don't have it and they're losing muscle, we just have to be careful about that because every stage is different and not everybody is working up. Um, towards weight loss, for example, like so many of our clients may have in the past decades prior to 50. I, I love that. And what I found when my kids went to college, like when I used to cook for the kids, whereas you say you don't have as much enjoyment, you don't get to, you know, you sit down to a meal and you eat a lot and you enjoy the company. I found that I gained weight after they moved out. I have four boys. They would finish everything on my plate. They inhale food. So I gained like 10 pounds when they left. And I thought that that was pretty interesting. But is so, Hilla, you know, you talk about protein. And my son, who's got that PhD in bioinformatics, is always like, Mom, you got to eat more protein. You're old. I'm like, I love you, honey. Get out of my house. Yes. Pass over the, the seafood. I'm trying to eat more fish. But I saw you nodding, Rosie, and you work with an active aging, specifically an active aging community, a very successful one in Florida. Um, what type of recommendations or what type of questions do you get? And I, I promise I saw some questions in the chat box. I'll get to those. Um, in the active aging group, I think it's important to remember that we're not only working with a slower metabolism, like Sohala said, but we also have this decline, um, declining appetite. We have our taste buds are not what they used to be. Um, our bone density is, is, is being reduced. We're not absorbing B12, for example, the same way. Our stomachs are emptying slower. We don't have as much stomach acid. Like there's a lot going on in that digestive process that we just, you know, maybe don't pay as much attention to. But uh, everything from loss of teeth, teeth are, <laughs> teeth are coming out, chewing is not the same, um, to decrease saliva, like, all of a sudden, the joy of eating, as we talked about, is different. And maybe the alcohol consumption is a little higher. And what I see with my clients is more so under eating than overeating in the active aging community, because that just does not appeal like it used to. So really getting them to make sure that they eat enough and quality nutrients, not hitting your, you know, not hitting your basal metabolic rate simply with um, wine, but making sure that those calories that you're taking in are fueling the body, are giving you the energy, encouraging movement and exercise so that you are hungrier during the day and you're going to eat more. Um, but I think with them, the, you know, the biggest thing is encouraging them to try new foods, use spices, try new recipes, make it easy and appeal to those cooking for just one or two individuals or cooking as a caregiver. A lot of active agers are caregivers for their older parents. And that can be really difficult when you have active agers at different life stages in the same house that you need to feed. 
And and Amber, before we turn the camera on, you were chatting about individuals and how we personalize this. How how do you find that to be? Um, what type of recommendations do you make to your clients? So when you are looking at individuals, you can't just say, oh, well, she's 65, so she needs to eat this list. And Rosie just gave us some really great gems there. So when you're working with a client on their nutrition, you have to look at their lifestyle. There are many factors that come into play with how you can help them design a nutrition plan that works for them at the stage of life where they are and at their age. So for instance, are they active or not? Are you working with someone who's actually working out consistently that's getting in three, four, five works at workouts a week? Or do you have someone who's more of a couch potato or maybe they only train with you one time a week? I have a lot of older clients who only see me once a week and that's not really consistent, really higher level activity, right? So they're um, in intake might need to be a little bit less than someone who's actually consistently doing that four to five days a week. Are they eating and or cooking for just one? So if you have someone who is a widow or widower, they probably don't feel like cooking a bunch of food there for just themselves. I hear that a lot from some of my clients and they're like, oh, I don't want to do all this, you know, work for one person for just me. So then they end up eating fast food or something, you know, that they can just grab out of the cabinet, like cheese crackers or whatever. So that's something to take into consideration as well. How many people are they cooking for? Are they just cooking for themselves and making it easy? Like Rosie said, teaching them how to get healthy foods in and making it easy. So it's not like this big production. Then you also have to take a look at their chronic health um, conditions. Are they having issues with heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, because that's going to change what they need to do. And I just want to say, for instance, I am not a registered dietitian. So at this point, this is where I would refer my client to someone like Soheya, so that because she is a registered dietitian. And when you have someone who has those issues, they're going to need a little bit more help than just someone who is, you know, maybe has their sports nutrition certification or something like that. And then medication use comes into play as well. Depending on what types of medication they're taking, that also is going to change what their nutrition needs to be potentially. And again, that's where you would refer out to your person who is a registered dietitian. So there's, there's a balance between, you know, we, we are the fitness experts and people ask us everything. You know, what do you eat? Yeah. Who is your doctor? Where did you buy that? You know, I mean, it's like, you know, everything from, you know, Lycra to, you know, to a body fat analysis. Um, and they, but there are, uh, I'm going to ask Robin if she'll put in information about the nutrition coaching certification that we have, which is specifically designed for group fitness and personal trainers to be able to do some nutrition coaching on a very broad base, which I think is very, very important because we are going to be asked these questions. And we do know some, some basic answers to provide. And we also know the line between what we should answer and what maybe possibly as Amber, you so astutely recommended what we should avoid. Um, and I totally have to agree that, you know, the kids are gone, I'm making dinner, me and my husband. I'm very excited. I learned how to cook over the pandemic. And it's just really simple recipes. And what do we also think about the microwave? Because I'll take like that cauliflower rice, punch a couple holes in it, throw it in. And I use, I'll throw a little bit of butter, a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper, I'm done. And sometimes I'll chop up parsley or throw in, you know, I don't know, onions, carrots, blah, 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 make it just a little bit interesting. But sometimes I want to be able to have just breakfast for dinner. Um, and we did get a really good question. Um, this is from the JCC. I'm not quite sure who it is. It said, why is it for women to lose body fat after menopause? I think what the question is supposed to be is why is it hard for women to lose body fat after menopause? 
Um, Amber, you're nodding. Can you answer that question and help us out? So that is a lot of my client base and my ladies who have gone through menopause. And there are so many factors that are involved with this. A big one is that our hormones are changing and our cortisol levels. Now there, I'm just going to, I'm not going to get real scientific. Okay. But I'm just going to tell you that our cortisol levels go up during menopause. And that is one of the things that starts to increase our body fat. Now there's a whole scientific reason for that. There's a big cycle that goes along with it. And some of our other professionals explain that much better than I do. But the issue is we've really got to help our ladies get that cortisol level down. And what is involved with that? Well, of course, nutrition is a part of it, having good nutrition and making sure that we're eating the proper foods that we need to, but also reducing our stress. So positive stress reduction techniques, working on getting quality sleep, which what happens when we go through menopause, our sleep gets affected. It all comes back to those hormones being changed and reducing and increasing and everything changing on us. So it, it's also a change usually in what type of a workout they're doing and making sure that sometimes you just go out and get a nice walk outside and enjoy the fresh air and the beautiful surroundings and just let your body relax and recover because we're so hyped up and busy in our lives. And then going through that with those increased cortisol levels, it's like we are just stacking stress on stress on stress on stress and not doing anything to bring that down. So that's one of the many factors of why it's so hard to lose body fat during menopause. That sleep interruption, which elevates the cortisol, which prevents some of the fat burning in the cycle. So Haley, you're, you're nodding and you're rolling. So can you elaborate a little bit or give us a little bit scientific? And then I'm also going to throw this at you. We got a very interesting question about how does a plant-based diet fit into these recommendations of nutrition through the ages? Okay. So as far as the hormones go, the sleep, the stress, the hormone change, all of that. And also the place that you put your fat tissue can relocate. If you used to put it more on your hips and legs, it's more likely to move to that central region, more of the apple shape happening um, around menopause. And that's more dangerous because it's closer to those vital organs. And so that can be challenging because that's not where you chose to put it and it's just happening that way. And I think that um, people in that older population are a little more susceptible to, oh, I heard somebody say that I need to do this because they're sensitive to their health more than they might have been 20 years ago before they were on medications and before they were um, concerned with certain end of life concerns. And so they're more susceptible to some people's food rules and to some people's things. And I've heard about this and what if I do that? And um, I really want to encourage people to be careful to not be like grabbing all these different Instagram tips and your trainer's tips if they're 20 and 30 and, you know, just giving you random things and really steer you know, what I always say with my clients is let's major on the majors. Let's look at your plate first. Let's make sure you're getting lots of colors and fiber. Let's not go multiple hours without eating just because you see an intermittent fasting ad every day doesn't mean that applies to you. I've seen the ones now they have intermittent fasting based on your chin fat. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is the most <laughs> the industry has ever gotten in the 25 years. Of but all I can say is this is <laughs> the fear of end of life. Um, hardships make people more likely to grab on to these things. So we have to be especially careful and not, um, and that's where they should be able to come to us as professionals within our scope where we can refer them on to somebody who's trustworthy or to help them, you know, find sites and things that we approve of rather than just scrolling the internet. And, and so Helen, now that I got you is um, Amy Sullivan actually asked a great question. Also, any advice for clients with hormonal issues such as overzealous estrogen or PCOS? Oh, goodness. Okay. That's a whole separate thing. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, and so I don't think we could address that in this workshop, okay. but um, Robin, would you pop my website in there? If somebody wants to just chat one-on-one -on -one about some of those things, I'm happy to, um, to collaborate and um, help with that. You had another question for me, Sarah. I want to make sure I address them all. Plant-based. Yes, plant-based, please. Okay. So 
people who are on a plant-based diet have to work harder to get their protein needs met. They don't have to work very hard at all to get carbohydrates met because carbohydrates um, like beans and peas and things like that um, tend to be a big part of helping people get their protein in. And a lot of people think that those are high protein sources. They are good protein sources, but they are not high protein sources unless we specifically um, narrow down to like, for example, um, chickpea pasta. It's mostly the protein in the pasta. So you're gonna have a higher protein. Um, so I like um, red lentil pasta, for example, chickpea pasta. Um, they've come a long way too. If you've tasted them 10 years ago and it was real grainy, try again, because they've come a long way. Black bean pastas, those have more protein than the beans themselves and a little less starch. So those are some easy go-tos. And if you're not against adding some Greek yogurt. Okay, wait, wait. I got to give you a little hint there because I started using those pastas and I'm going to tell you, they taste terrible. But if instead of using just water when you boil them, you use a chicken broth or a bone broth, you get a little extra protein and the flavor is better. Just sharing. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> If you are okay with um, a diet that's mostly plant-based, but has some dairy or some bone broth, right. for example, bone broth is a great, uh, look at you, Sarah, giving nutrition tips. I love it. Yeah, don't get used to it. All right. <laughs> I love black bean soup and some other bean-based soups. And I do use bone broth because instead of having zero grams of protein, it has eight or nine. I like the Pacific brand and you can even get it at Walmart. Mm -hmm. um, and so get that so that you can get the protein in if you're not opposed to that, because it's still very plant based if I'm eating a whole bowl of black bean soup with having yeah. bone broth. Also, Greek yogurt is just I think it should be a daily part of people's diet if they're not vegan, because it gives easy, easy protein, easy to digest for most people because it doesn't have that much lactose as people tend to think it does because of the Greek yogurt processing. Um, and I think it's just an easy way to do it. And you can even put some toppings on it to make it kind of a fun spot in your day. Um, you know, some cashews or dark chocolate bits or something like that um, to make it kind of a fun spot. So those are just a, a couple quick basic things on plant-based. Yeah, and I do. And if you don't, if you're a, a strict um, vegetarian and you don't want to do the chicken broth or anything for the, for the noodles, if you do use the vegetable-based broth, when you boil your pasta, it also um, and enhances the flavor. Just again, I'm sharing. And Rosie, I saw you nodding. What other things would you recommend for someone who might be leaning more towards a plant-based diet? From the perspective of those with specialty diets, um, specific, I work with a lot of clients, myself included, that have autoimmune disorders. And so what we eat is really based on what the body can handle on that day. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of that changes day to day. So for those of you who have that yourself or you're working with clients who are struggling, I would recommend trying your own version of almost an elimination diet, removing some things from your diet or trying new things into your diet and being really mindful of only one variable at a time to see how that affects your body. So for, I know myself that red meat is really hard to digest. And as much as I love it, it is still usually higher in saturated fat. It's, you know, we're gonna worry about a little bit more about cholesterol. So um, I would be trying a leaner meat, a chicken breast or a turkey breast or a form of seafood. So working with your clients to identify things that they can play around with that work for their body, that don't cause bloating, that don't cause discomfort. And a lot of times that um, plant-based diet, uh, little additions here and there can really help with that, that increase in fiber, that increase in a feeling of satiation without that bloating and discomfort is a, is a big aha moment for a lot of people. Perhaps dairy has been an issue, but they just didn't know it because they've never eliminated it from their diet or they've never tried Greek yogurt over a regular yogurt. Maybe they've used lots of soft cheeses instead of harder cheeses. Harder cheeses have lower lactose. So um, by playing around with that and knowing that there are those options that they can try the next time they're in the grocery store, it might just open up to a whole new world of possible recipes. 
And we did get a question of I'm from Annette. I'm 58 and my body and sleeping patterns have changed so much. Um, she says she bought the lentil pasta. But how, Amber, are you dealing with a client that, let's say, was pretty consistent with their workout and is going on, and then boom, it just the sleep starts changing. I remember with my hormones start changing. It's just, it, it feels like it's, it's daily and it's constant and the sweating and it's just, uh, how do we handle that? And how do we recommend to our clients that they handle it? Well, the one thing that I always encourage them is to find a doctor who is going to listen to them and listen to, you know, the symptoms that they are experiencing and help them to figure out how to get their hormones balanced well for them. I think that's key. And uh, sometimes, you know, it takes a little bit of trial and error to find the right person, but that's something that I do. And then helping them just to work through all of the different ways that they can actually help themselves in their own life, in their own choices that they're making. And I know we kind of touched on alcohol a little bit, but whenever I, and this, again, this is my experience, but I see my ladies, they will start to have problems with sleeping and then they try to have the wine at night to relax. And it maybe it does help them to go to sleep, but then for a lot of them, it interrupts their sleep even worse later on. So they might go to sleep fast, but then they find themselves tossing and turning and they're up at night. And so we, I really encourage them to start to look at some of those things. Like, can you reduce your alcohol intake and see if it doesn't help you sleep better? Um, I'm big on also looking at, you know, their blue light, you know, are you looking at your phone before you go to bed? So thinking about these sleeping habits, we want to get into that place where we can relax and come down, we can bring the lights down, we can maybe read a book or do something that's a little more calming. So it's not just like, okay, eat this, do this, you know, there's so many factors that we need to look at in their lifestyle to help them to get to a place where they're feeling better and doing better and their body is going to change. I also tell people like we're so many of our, my peoples are stuck on like this number. They want to be like, I want to be 140. And it's like, okay, well, maybe your body is changing. Your body is changing and let's release that and start to look more at our health. What is your health? Are you doing all of the things that are increasing your health and helping you to feel your best. I think that's very important too. And our nutrition is a big part of that. Eating the lean protein, getting in enough colorful fruits and vegetables, making sure you've got enough carbohydrates and making a nice balanced plate. That's and all I like, I, Amber, I also like you brought up the alcohol and you brought up the wine. Because if I have a glass of wine, two glasses of wine, I am up at 3 a.m. Without yep. a doubt. And it's not like this little toss and turn. It's like, I am awake. I'm ready to do emails. I'm ready to go jogging. I'm yep. wide awake. And that, you you have to watch it. We got some great advice, which I'm going to throw in here. Mushroom broth has a lot of flavor. So somebody added that. Somebody also did edamame. They recommend edamame. They recommend tempeh. If you're doing those, you need protein, but you're doing... Um, uh, but you're trying to stay uh, vegetarian. And um, how about cooking your plant-based pasta and wine? Thank you, John. <laughs> and well, hopefully you, the alcohol evaporates out of there. Um, so I think that this is pretty, very interesting. And then Heidi just shares, I just heard a really interesting talk earlier today on how sunlight regulates sleep. And that's a little bit what Amber was talking about with the blue light, when you get the blue light on your, on your phone. And this doctor recommends getting 10 minutes of sunlight outdoors as early as possible and every morning. And the outdoor light has been seen to be extremely important. And uh, my son, who my other son, who has got migranosis, who's, who gets migraines, the doctors are actually prescribing walking outside because 
because they think the sunlight is so healthy. So it's really interesting that we're seeing this happen. So uh, if, Rosie, I'm gonna ask you, with all sorts of calculators available for macros and, and other needs, you know, how do we adjust for the different stages of life? You know, besides, I, I love Sohala's plates and things like that. How do people adjust? Because again, you're dealing with a lot of people at, um, at I'm trying to remember the name of the facility you're at in Florida. Trilogy. Trilogy, yes. Um, and you get a t you must get a ton of questions from these clients. What are some of the major questions and how do you respond to them? I think the first is that excess caloric intake crosses all life stages. So if there, if you are eating in excess, no matter how old you are, um, that's going to be an issue. So whether you are four or 94, if it's in excess of what your body actually needs and can process and use, um, that's always going to be a problem. The second is taking into consideration your activity level. So your, you know, we talk about uh, total daily energy expenditure. And I think what gets confusing to people is that you can be a very active group fitness groupie. You can be riding your bike every afternoon. Um, you could take lots of classes and do lots of fun outdoor activities. But if you also have a sedentary job where you are sitting eight hours a day, your daily energy expenditure is still going to be on the lower scale, um, lower end of the spectrum. So you may not need as many calories as you might think, or it might vary day to day on those high energy days and that energy output, you need lots of calories versus those lower energy days. So sometimes I think people think that they can eat a certain way all the time when really um, taking into consideration Amber's lifestyle and um, making sure that you're answering questions for your clients that are specific to how they're living their roller coaster energy lives. And that's just huge. I also think, Sarah, we talked about um, making the psychosocial. Sure yeah. I thought that was really very bright, very smart on your part. Um, if you are a trainer, while you don't need to totally understand where everyone is at every life stage, I would encourage you to look up Erickson's psychosocial development stages. And that's going to take from infancy all the way to senior citizens. Um, and at what stage in our life we're really focused on relationship building, exploration, um, personal control. And all of that influences how and why we eat, when we eat and what's important to us. So if you have a minute to look at psychosocial development and really hone in at the age, the population of people you're working with, it'll help you understand what outside influences um, may be contributing to their body image, their need for food, looking at it as fuel or a horrible thing or a social event. Um, and that could really help you guide and counsel when you're working with your clients. Okay, now this is a little odd question, you guys. It's not part of the webinar, but we got a really good question here from Tina. How do you know how many calories you burn? So I'm wondering, are you guys, what do you guys think of using? I mean, I use my my Apple Watch to see how much, you know, when I'm walking or I'll put it on when I'm doing my yoga class, it monitors my heart rate. And I kind of, I enjoy it. I also have an app on my phone when I'm skiing. So I know how fast I'm going. I went 42 miles an hour yesterday skiing downhill. Like why I'm still alive, I'm not sure. But 15 miles, you know, how, how far you go, how fast you go and what your heart rate is. And then it'll calculate if you throw in your age very roughly how many calories you expended that day. What are your thoughts on that? So, Hale, I'm going to like, what do you think? Because technology, there's screaming apps and they're screaming, you know, now we're using a watch and you want to know the next thing they're doing. They're putting all these monitors in your earbuds. So you can check your heart rate. You can check your blood glucose level. You can check all these other things. Fascinating. It is. And I think I want to tie two questions together because we've talked a little bit about lifestyle 
and big picture. And, you know, people really usually want to have like this one bullet, you know, they want to hang up with like, there's this one thing I should do. And I think all of us has touched, touched on the factors that there's the, the community aspect and the sunshine and the, all these different pieces. So it's, it's a lot more complex than people want it to be. And so if they punch in numbers to their app and they say, here's how old I am, here's what I want to weigh. It, it doesn't take that big picture into account, which is a selling point for all of us to work with people one-on-one -on -one because it doesn't take that. My fitness pal gives almost everybody 1200 across the board because everybody says they want to weigh what they weighed on their wedding day or the last time they had a stomach bug. And so they put in this unrealistic number. And so my fitness pal is like, you can either starve or 1200. That's all I can do. And so people start looking at these numbers and they forget like some of the things we've all mentioned is the, do I feel good? Do I feel energetic? Did I sleep hard? Was exercise fun or was it a total drag? And all those things. So I think all those monitors, Sarah, like you mentioned, could be really helpful. They can also, a lot of my clients get very obsessed with them and it's a downward spiral in their health journey sometimes. So they have to find that balance, especially if they have a little extra time on their hand in certain stages of life where that becomes kind of a new obsession that they realize is not, is not healthy. Yeah, 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 you think it's a little obsession. <laughs> not no, I just think that it's something we have to be careful of um, because, you know, it, sometimes like we have to just look at each thing and say, is this serving my big picture of wellness? And sometimes it is for some people and then for some people. And that's why it so matters so much if we listen and are good listeners to our clients so we can see, hey, that sounds like this could be a challenge for you. Is this, is this serving you better than when you didn't do it? Um, and I think those are important questions. So Yes, all those monitors can be really helpful. I think we should use them as trends. General trends. I like that. I and like that. As a general, as a general way. overview. Now, Rosie, I'm going to throw this at you. And Legretta asked a question. I know it may be too late to answer this, but what do you think about eating to your blood type? What are your thoughts on that? Because kind of talking about technology a little bit. I think number one, I'm curious if everyone knows their blood type and when the last time they looked at that. Um, but I think that it follows in line and maybe so how I, you could talk about it more, but I think it follows in line with some of the, the trends that are going on and being presented as just, you know, another option. This is one great way to do it. And have you tried this? And I think that every body, not everybody, but every body is very, very different in what it requires and what it needs and what it does well with. So being more mindful of your body and taking things for like a grain of, what's it, what is it? A grain of sand, a grain of salt? With a grain of, with a grain of salt. Yeah, with a grain <laughs> of salt. I, oh, I can never say those correctly, um, but <laughs> I, I try not to get too attached to anything. That's like choosing my food based on my favorite color. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I try, I like reading up on those and I like knowing that they're available and knowing what's out there because you're going to get questions. But I think that it is, it can be dangerous to follow something so critic, so critically, right? I love How that. I agree. And I think too, Sarah, one thing is that there's so many options. There's so many options in the grocery store and there's so many options in the media from diets that people do benefit when they're, just like when you're looking at your clothes, if you had three things, you would do really well picking one of them quickly. And the more you have, the more shoes you have, the more overwhelming it gets. And it's the same way with food messages. And so sometimes people really latch on to the blood type or something similar because it just makes the world a smaller, more easy place to manage. And so if it, if they really love it, I can say, it sounds like it's just more manageable to you, but I don't want you to leave out some of these important things because the research doesn't fully support that. So let's, let's limit your, you know, grocery tours to a smaller amount of things. So it sounds reasonable, but then maybe it's not going to have to be this trend. And so kind of help them understand that it's really probably that they want things easier than it is that they want so to they can manage it. I think that's great. I'm going to show you guys a quick video. I want you guys to see some of these lovely leaders are going to be at our DC Mania convention, which everybody's very excited about. And we have a great video to share.
this is a live conference, which is very exciting. Um, it's going to be recorded, though. We have our full nutrition room, all 16 lectures, six from Friday, six from Saturday, four from Sunday. They're all being recorded, and they're involved in our recording. So if you can't go to D.C., at least you can enjoy a the live presentations, which I really like because I feel like it's a little more current. We also have, let me show you this, we have an active aging convention coming up. So I want you to take a look at this. Um, we've got, um, it's March 19th and 20th. We've got 72 different sessions, four sessions every hour in the hour. And we're going to be talking about nutrition as well as active aging. So we've got these wonderful events coming up for you guys. We know we've got DC in February, come the end of March, early April, April 1st through 3rd, we're gonna be in California. And then in May, we're in Florida. And in at the begin, very beginning of August, end of July, we're going to be in Atlanta. And at the end of August, we're gonna be back in Dallas. And the end of September, early October, we'll be in Chicago, blah, blah, blah. We just keep going. So thank you for joining us tonight. So Hala, thank you. Amber, thank you. Rosie, thank you. You ladies are fantastic. Thank you for joining the webinar. I will see you all next Tuesday night. Have a fabulous week. Yes. Bye guys. And thank you, Bye. Robin Taylor, for running this for us. Thank you, Robin. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.